Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. And uh, this is a program I've been looking forward to for a very, very long time. Uh, I have two of my uh, colleagues here, I say remotely, because Barton Gelman was almost a fellow, was sort of a fellow here. One of the first things, uh, notes I got uh, from Steve Call, who's my far right, uh, our president, of course, a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning author, uh, just uh, was noted in Michiko Kakatani's top ten list of books you ought to get for the Bin Laden's and Arabian uh, story in the American century. Uh, Steve is, of course, president here of New America Foundation. But the first note I got from Steve is there's this guy named Bart Gelman who's going to be working on a book, and if we have any office space, we ought to provide it for it because it'll be good New America branding and we'll get some credit. Never heard from Bart, never <laughs> offered the office space, but boy had I wished it had come through. Um, Bart Gelman, of course, is the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning chronicler of Vice President Cheney, his role and influence uh, in, in Washington uh, in a four-part series in the Washington Post uh, that was extraordinary, so captivating. It was, I shouldn't say this because, you know, Steve Cole, of course, was the former managing editor of the Washington Post, but there are some days where I don't run. Uh, to get the Washington Post <laughs> is the first thing in the morning. Uh, but then when, when uh, Bart Gelman's pieces, which he co-wrote then with Joe Becker, uh, were coming out, they were extraordinarily important. And while well, I could say a lot of other things about G Bart Gelman's past and, and, and other Pulitzers uh, uh, he's participated in with, with uh, Steve Cole, I don't want to belabor it too much, but to say that understanding this administration, the Bush administration, wherever people may be politically, is really vital to understanding how the presidency is changing, how the sort of, as I called it, the inboxes and outboxes of power are rerouted. And I found no one who's chronicled this better uh, than Barton Gelman. And I, and I wrote this in a review, and, I, and it wasn't a gushing review. It was, re if you really want to understand how this town operates, you can't understand the Bush administration without, in my view, uh, uh, reading Bart Gelman's book. And I say this with some trepidation because I had read all of the books by Bob Woodward about Bush's decision to go to war and about various aspects of the war. And as you saw, Bob Woodward himself sort of evolved through this series of books. Uh, and I think he's still evolving and trying to understand what happened. But after the third book, uh, I don't, can't remember, was it uh, the name of the th third Woodward book? State of um, Denial. State, State of Denial. Denial, which was a really great book. Nonetheless, the, really the last section of Bob Woodward's book made the comment that Vice President Cheney was sort of an eccentric figure who really didn't matter. And it was an extraordinary comment by, by Woodward. And, and, it, and it makes what Gelman has done even more important, because it's very clear when you read Gelman's book that Cheney and David Addington and the people around him really did matter, but tried very hard to evade the kind of scrutiny that Bart Gelman gave them. So, uh, with that introduction, let me invite Bart Gelman, who's written an extraordinary book, uh, Angler, the, the Cheney Vice Presidency. Uh, I want to say hello as well to those viewers that are with us on the New America Foundation website and the Washington Note website. And we'll have a really fun exchange uh, with Bart here in a minute. And I've asked Steve Cole to share his comments uh, after Bart Gelman gives some remarks. And then I'll open it up to a very active, fun exchange. Uh, Bart Gelman. You can clap. <laughs> Uh, you ought to wait and find out whether it's worth it <laughs> afterward. Uh, so I, I do make the case that it, that you can't understand what happened these last eight years without understanding Cheney's role. And that's different from saying that he ran the whole show. I don't think that's true. I think that George Bush really was the decider when he wanted to be and uh, when he knew that the decision was on the table. There, were, there are a few times, and he, he normally did, but there are a few very important times in Angler where I document that, that just critical decisions were being made and, and the President did not know about that. In fact, I, I confronted uh, Andy Card with that uh, in the only conversation in which he did not hang up on me <laughs> before the conversation started. Uh, and uh, he defended that uh, in, in terms that would be familiar to anyone who's, who's uh, studied uh, White House. He said that, um, I don't think it would be appropriate for the President to be engaged in the to and fro until it is, you know, penultimate, he said. Uh, and every administration faces this question. You don't, want, you don't want the President involved in decisions below his pay grade. He gets bogged down in detail. Uh, but he needs to know enough to know when he wants to intervene. And in one of the 
uh, crucial episodes of this book, which I did not expect uh, to be a central focus. Uh, it ended up taking uh, two whole chapters. It was what happened when the Justice Department came to believe that the warrantless domestic surveillance program was unlawful. And uh, I thought what I was looking for was why uh, they thought it was unlawful or exactly what it was doing. And uh, those are vital subjects, and I just broke my sword on that. I, I cannot to this day tell you exactly what the program is doing. I know a little bit more than I wrote, but I didn't have enough confidence in the picture to uh, put my name to it in the book. What I found unexpectedly was that you could treat that as a black box of unknown content and still have a remarkable and dramatic story to tell that is, is probably much more consequential in the history of this presidency and the presidency itself which is that the Vice President withheld from Bush the knowledge for three months that the Justice Department was in full rebellion and tried to suppress that rebellion on his own uh, before it got to Bush, and that he brought Bush to the very brink of uh, being a one-term president because uh, Bush was about an hour away from losing the entire upper echelon of his Justice Department and the director of the FBI and the general counsel of the CIA who were all about to resign in principle for reasons that Bush was unaware, uh, uh, or certainly not fully aware. And so uh, I'm going to read you a, a couple of s a brief scenes from Angler that, uh, that tell you part of that story. Uh, one of the things you have to understand about Cheney is the way he controlled process. And uh, process is normally a really boring subject, and we try to avoid those stories, <laughs> the Washington Post and elsewhere, because nobody wants to read them. But Cheney understood preeminently where the pivot points are in the bureaucracy and how to put your finger on the scale at just one little moment in one little place and the whole outcome changes. It can be deletion of a few words from the text of an executive order or a regulation. It can be the swinging of one vote. It can be any number of things. And uh, of course, classically, a big part of that is control over information. And, and Cheney operated with enormous effect and yet uh, as low a profile as possible. I mean, you have, it's uh, an irresistible subject when you have someone who's simultaneously the most powerful and the most secretive uh, high official we've ever seen who was not actually the president. Uh, Cheney was, I think, as close to a deputy president as we've had. I'll give you one tiny example before we get to the national security stuff. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, in uh, his second term wrote an executive order intended to give uh, Al Gore saw some substantial power over regulatory review. Whenever any major agency had a big regulation to propose, it had to run through a White House counsel first, and Al Gore was uh, the titular head of that counsel. Uh, Cheney asked George Bush, and this would seem peculiar to any student of Washington, to remove the office of the vice president from that executive order. He asked Bush, to, there, were, there were maybe two dozen references to the vice president in that order. And if you take a look at the Federal Register and uh, the uh, concordance of the uh, successor orders to the original, you find that almost the only change is that uh, every reference to the vice president is deleted. And yet Cheney actually did run that process. And the other thing the executive order did under Bush was to give greater power, to concentrate even more power over regulations in that White House Review Council. Uh, and so Cheney was simultaneously more influential than Gore uh, on environmental and other regulations and invisible. And so this is, this is the fundamental, uh, this is a fundamental of the Cheney method. So when they created, and it was Cheney who essentially uh, conceived and created the warrantless surveillance program. When they created this, uh, you have the peculiar situation in which the vice president and his counsel are, uh, are overseeing a national security and intelligence operation and controlling who knows about it. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, there are three official 
uh, degrees of classification for national security information, confidential, secret, top secret. But then above top secret, there is what's known as sensitive compartmented information. Compartment being the idea that <coughs> even if you're cleared for top secret, you don't need to know everything. So you get access to the compartment. You get busted into that compartment if you have a need to know and the sufficient clearance to get there. And ordinarily in an intelligence operation, it would be the director of the CIA or conceivably National Security Advisor, the, uh, the White House Counsel, who would control the compartment. David Addington controlled the compartment on this warrantless domestic surveillance program, and here are some of the people who were not considered to have a need to know about it. The President's uh, uh, Deputy National Security Advisor, Deputy Chief of Staff, the Chief Counterterrorism Advisor, the Homeland Security Advisor, the Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, and Condi Rice's lawyer, John Bellinger. And Bellinger started to hear, because it, he, was the, he was the top national security lawyer in the White House, he started to hear odd references uh, to a vice president's special program. And to, or are you going to be at the meeting at four? Uh, what meeting? Oh, yeah, that's the vice president's special program, I guess. Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the third time this happened, uh, Bellinger sort of marched down two floors, the Eisenhower Executive Office building, and into EEOB 268, which is Addington's office, and said, I know you're up to something, <laughs> and I'm supposed to know about it, and uh, you tell me. And Addington, according to a contemporary account of that meeting, notes of which were taken, um, said, um, he said, it, uh, I'm not going to tell you whether there is or is not such a program, but if there were such a program, you'd better go tell your little friends at the FBI and CIA to keep their mouths shut. Uh, and this is, this, is, uh, this is the senior national security lawyer in the White House. Uh, it was years before he was cleared into the program and not because Cheney's office wanted that. So uh, let me give you a sense of how it is that they uh, – they controlled this. So first of all, it start, it, the whole program starts with a hypothetical question that Cheney asks. And uh, one of my Cheney rules, if you want to uh, uh, codify them as Cheney rules of acquiring and exercising power, is that hypothetical questions aren't. Uh, there comes a time soon after 9-11 when, uh, when Cheney asks, uh, George Tenet and Mike Hayden to come talk to him. And here's the scene. Uh, he, he asks, he asks uh, what they're not doing that they could be doing. Uh, Cheney asked George Tenet to find out what the NSA might do differently if unleashed. Uh, Michael Hayden, its director, came back with a Venn diagram, three ovals with overlapping edges. One oval represented the spy master's ideal, everything desirable that SIGINT might provide. A second showed what could be done with present technology. The third oval included only what was legal. The agency, <laughs> Hayden told the vice president, worked inside the space where all three of those ovals intersected. The vice president looked at Hayden's three ovals, desirable, possible, legal. Set aside the third one, Jenny said. What could you accomplish if you stopped closing your eyes and ears? to communications inside the United States. And as we all know, uh, it was Cheney's view that because the president is commander in chief, because the executive is a unitary branch of government, uh, uh, that there was no limit that Congress or the courts could set on his exercise of commander in chief powers in wartime. So the legal argument was it doesn't really matter what the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act or other relevant legislation meant. So now here's what happens when the Inspector General and the General Counsel of the National Security Agency start hearing rumors that the Justice Department is worried about the program. They want to know more. A burst of ferocity stunned the room into silence. No other word for it. The Vice President's attorney was shouting, the President doesn't want this. You are not going to see the opinions. You are out of your lane. Five government lawyers had gathered around the small conference table in the Justice Department Command Center. Four were expected. David Addington got wind of the meeting and invited himself. It was going to be a very short meeting. 
This is none of your business, Addington exploded. This is the president's program. If Brenner and Potenza, those are the NSA lawyers, had replied with the auditor equivalent of, you're not the boss of me, they would have been right. The two men could have pressed their document request and told the big loud man from the White, the White House to get out of their way. But that kind of thing did not happen often to an emissary of the vice president, Addington least of all. The NSA lawyers returned to their car empty handed. Now, going down the line, uh, got lots of scenes and rules that describe why you don't really want to mess with the vice president or his office. Uh, give you one example. Uh, call this rule uh, if you're pissed off at Cheney, kick someone else. <laughs> The second or third time that Cheney blindsided Rice and Powell, the two of them decided to send a message. They synchronized an appearance to lodge a complaint with White House counsel Al Gonzalez. Powell at her side, Rice blazed with anger. There will be no more secret opinions on international and national security law, she commanded. If it happened again, she would go straight to the president. Powell remarked admiringly as they emerged that Rice dressed down Gonzalez in, quote, full nurse ratchet mode. <laughs> he had just compared the national security advisor to the head nurse in the 1975 film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which happened to be set, a colleague pointed out, in a mental hospital. <laughs> no one believed that poor Fredo was in charge of the decision to exclude Rice and Powell, but neither of them raised a ruckus with the vice president or even with Addington. When it came to Cheney, Rice's voice, like Nurse Ratched's late in the movie, was choked to a whisper. Uh, here's another thing about process. Seems really simple, but um, it's very powerful. Uh, not only did Cheney and his office see every piece of paper on its way to the president, uh, which has been true to one degree or another uh, in other administrations, especially under Gore, uh, but uh, they saw things that other people didn't know they were seeing. Uh, and here's a, here's a moment when John Bellinger writes a very frank memo to Condi Rice, his boss. Again, he's the national security lawyer for the White House at the time. Uh, he uh, gives advice that he knows that Cheney won't like. And then Bellinger found out something that in three years as a top advisor to Rice, he had never known. Every time he wrote a memo to his boss, a blind copy was routed to the vice president's office. Scooter Libby, according to one official, had made the arrangement with Steve Hadley, Rice's deputy. It was not advertised, and neither was it reciprocated. What happened in Cheney's office stayed in Cheney's office. Two more short scenes that refer to the uh, vice president's special program. This one is, uh, if you're going to fight the vice president, don't hold back. Uh, Jack Goldsmith, who was head of the Office of Legal Counsel, succeeded uh, uh, a kind of figurehead who, um, uh, who was actually um, controlled by John Yu, his underling. Uh, and James Comey, who was the Deputy Attorney General, uh, had been fighting with uh, Cheney and Cheney's office saying that the uh, surveillance program is unlawful. Uh, Cheney called a meeting to change their minds. The staging had been arranged for maximum impact. Cheney sat at the head of Andy Card's rectangular table, pivoting left to face the acting attorney general. This is a time when uh, uh, Ashcroft's in the hospital. The two men were close enough to touch. This program, Cheney said, was vital. Turning it off would leave us blind. It would be a profound mistake. How can you possibly be reversing course on something of this importance after all this time, Cheney asked. Comey held his ground. I will accept for purposes of discussion that it's as valuable as you say it is, Comey said. That only makes this more painful. If I can't find a lawful basis for something, you're telling me you really, really need to do it? Doesn't help. Others see it differently, Cheney said. There was only one of those, really. John Yu had been out of the picture for nearly a year. It was all Addington. The analysis is flawed, in fact, facially flawed, Comey said. Lawyers speak for flawed on its face. No lawyer reading that could reasonably rely on it, he said. Gonzalez said nothing. Addington stood by the window over Cheney's shoulder. He had heard a bellyful. Well, I'm a lawyer, and I did, he said, glowering, glowering at Comey. No good lawyer, Comey said. <laughs> uh, 
and here's the last thing I'll read for now, and we can uh, uh, talk more about uh, lessons learned afterward. Uh, here's the moment when George Bush and Jim Comey have a private conversation, and each of them gets a huge surprise. It's the day after Bush has renewed the program over explicit Justice Department objections. Uh, it's not clear, well, actually, it is clear. It's clear that he did not know the extent and breadth of those objections. Uh, and I trace in this chapter the chain of events that led to Bush's discovery that he'd better talk privately to Comey. Uh, it had started a couple of days earlier when Comey went to Fran Townsend, who was the, at the time the uh, counterterrorism advisor to Bush. And he said, I'm going to tell you a word. I want you to tell me if you recognize this word, because we need to talk. And he said the word, which was the secret code name for the program. You know, if you have a compartmented program, it'll have a name like banana, and all of the, uh, all the paperwork will be stamped top secret slash banana. So he said the word, whatever it was, and Fran Townsend said, we can't have this conversation. Uh, whatever you're talking about, I'm not cleared for. But Comey looked very troubled, so Townsend went to her immediate boss, who was Connie Rice, and said, uh, Jim Comey just came to me. He's very worried, and he's talking about bananas. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Rice also didn't know exactly what was going on at the Justice Department. She was cleared for the program, but she was not invited by Cheney to the meetings in which these debates were taking place. But so this is 7.30 Friday morning, uh, right after Bush has signed the ag agreement the day before, the reauthorization the day before. Rice is alone with uh, Bush for just a couple of minutes before the 8.30 terror meeting, and she says, something's going on with Comey, don't know what, maybe you ought to talk to him, he's a reasonable guy. Let's find out what's on his mind. So they go through the uh, daily terrorism briefing. Uh, it's the day after the Madrid bombing, so there's lots to talk about. Comey and Bob Mueller are, uh, are there briefing the president, and their intention is to leave the Oval Office and resign. Uh, and uh, they don't want to <coughs> make a big door slamming splash about it, but they believe they can't in good faith stay in the government now that Bush has done what he's done. And they're walking out the door and Bush says, Jim, can I talk to you for a minute? And pulls him into the private dining room just off the Oval Office, which Clinton made famous for other reasons. <laughs> and uh, here's, here's the conversation. Bush's tone grew crisp. I decide what the law is for the executive branch, he said. That's absolutely true, sir. You do. But I decide what the Department of Justice can certify and what it can't. Now Bush said something that floored Comey. I just wish you weren't raising this at the last minute. The last minute? He didn't know. The president said a few more words. Not the way it's supposed to work, popping out with the news like this. Day before a deadline? Wednesday. He didn't know till Wednesday. No wonder he sent Andy Card and Al Gonzalez to the hospital. Oh, Mr. President, if you've been told that, you have been very poorly served by your advisors, Comey said. Comey was edging toward a breach of his own personal rule against resignation threats. You resign or you don't. He had already decided. The problem, he told friends afterward, was he could no longer assume the president had made an informed decision. This man just needs to know what's about to happen. I think you should know that Director Mueller is going to resign today, Comey said. Bush raised both eyebrows. He shifted in his chair. He could not hide it or did not try. He was gobsmacked. At the end of this meeting, he asks to talk to Mueller, who's waiting for Comey. At the end of his meeting with Mueller, he caves in. And he says, uh, never mind. The order I signed yesterday, forget about it. You tell me how I have to rewrite it, and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, this is something that we did not fully understand until now, and it is, I would argue, a historic moment in the history of the presidency, not just of George Bush, that there's not a t another time in American history when a president in wartime made what he believed to be a, a major decision against the advice of his aides, and uh, let alone within 24 hours, completely reversed himself because of threat to resign. Uh, president Tyler allowed his whole cabinet to resign uh, and stuck by his decision. Uh, you. You just can't find another case like this, and for the uh, sort of chest-thumping unitary executive White House uh, of all unitary executive White Houses, this is a remarkable development that people will remember for a long time. Bart, thank you. Uh, now to uh, share his views on, on some of this, and then we'll be uh, at it. Uh, Steve Cole, President of the New America Foundation. 
Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Bart. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about the book and about Bart. I don't know how many of you have actually read the book, but if you are relying on the post excerpts uh, as substantial and, and exciting as those were, uh, as a sort of digest, pick up the book and read the whole <laughs> thing, because it really, uh, it, the, the fullness of what Bart has achieved as a reporter and also as a narrative writer is only available if you read, if you read Angler. I think it's for sale. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, but you also, can't have too many. you can't have too many, especially at this time Christmas of year. Christmas. Yeah. But uh, it opens. It, I've worked with Bart. I, he's a friend, but also a role model for many of us in national security reporting against hard targets. And when I had the privilege to be his colleague at the Post as, as his editor, we would often assign him the most difficult subject that was out there in national security reporting. He would usually resist for about three or four weeks. Then he would eventually, his pride would take over. He would then complain for about two or three months that it was impossible, that it simply could not be done, that it was a fool's errand. And we would assure him that he was going to get paid anyway, that he should just stay after it. And then about six weeks before deadline, he'd say, it's, it's slowly turning into it. Maybe something worthwhile will come of it. Then finally, he'd agree to a Sunday to launch. And uh, on, it would be an enormous project of writing, because it would require not just in deep reporting, as this book does, but clarity and drive and narrative momentum and, and a lot of detail, because Bart really works from the grains of sand out to the big picture. He's always in possession of both. That's why he's great. And what was remarkable as an editor was on Friday afternoon, Two days before the launch of a major series in the Washington Post, if you peeked inside Bart's basket where the draft was, there were there was really only just random paragraphs distributed <laughs> around. There was no there was no story, there was no top, but you just learned to have faith, and you knew that about Saturday at 3 p.m. the whole thing would snap into place, and it wouldn't require a lick of editing. Uh, he's a master. He really is the best in his generation, and. It's always a privilege to, to be around him. But I urge you to read the book because you can't, that's his first book, which is, you know, I'm, I think important. He, he's going to be around for a long while and read for a long while, but this is his first book length work and you should read it as a book because it succeeds as a book. From the first page, this amazing chapter, which I guess was never excerpted about how Cheney became vice president and how he left Frank Keating uh, in the ditch uh, on, during while vetting him for the job. It's really just an extraordinary get and quite a lot of fun to read. The other thing that I really appreciated about the book that wasn't really available in the series, just by the nature of the excerpting, was that you know, Bart's very fair-minded. He's always reaching to try to understand the world from Cheney's point of view. This is certainly not a book that proceeds from the idea that this is evil that needs to be exposed. It's, it, it's far uh, fairer and subtler than that. And it's not only about Cheney and his office. It, it becomes in total about the executive branch in ways it teaches you quite a lot about the executive branch that, that no other investigative reporting of this kind has yet done. And I include uh, you know, Bob Woodward's terrific reporting in that. There's, there's, a, there's a picture of how the office of the president and the office of the vice president worked before Cheney got there. And I don't know whether you would agree with this, but one of the impressions I came away with was that, as, as you said, referring to that, that uh, p entry in the Federal Register where the changes were subtle but the consequences ran deep, it didn't require a lot of structural change for Cheney's office to essentially hijack aspects of the presidency, that it was built into the system. It took will and vision and drive and maybe a weak president, which is the only question I wanted to ask you about. Um, but uh, in the end, I think it's a book that's relevant for the Obama administration, because while no one can imagine uh, that, uh, one can imagine that both the president and the vice president have theories of the case in their head about how this executive branch will operate in a manner distinct from the Bush administration's executive branch, first of all, as far as Bart's book goes, there's still a mystery about how that executive branch actually operated. Uh, so it's hard to develop a new theory if you don't 
have confidence about what you're actually inheriting. Um, but also, I'm not sure uh, what the um, constitutional model for the office of the vice president in the modern era is really is. You know, there's a great deal of scholarship and debate and discourse about other offices, particularly the National Security Advisor. Uh, and certainly, you know, we have big uh, legislative histories, uh, Goldwater Nichols to talk about the chain of command and civil military relations. But there really isn't a framework for, for OVP uh, other than the one that, that has been built up through kind of case law experience. And what that actually implies, what the executive branch really ought to be about in that respect, I think is an important question. Because finally, you know, one of the insights that I think uh, if it's either your sort of parenthetical observation or it's something that one of Cheney, Cheney's aides says early on in the book is that the insight that he had as he built his office was he couldn't be fired, that he, that he was operating from a constitutional rather than an appointed position. And that was fundamental to the choices that he made uh, and to the power that he accreted. So I just wanted to ask one question as, as I turn it back to Steve. Um, which I think you sort of hint at in places in the book, but I wonder how you would distill it, which is, and it, it was, it, it's suggested by the recent interview that the President gave to Charlie Gibson yesterday in which he said that he felt that he was unprepared for war. Now, you know, you can't read too much into throwaway lines in, in interviews of that kind, but it was striking, and it takes you back to the whole flow of decision making uh, between 9-11 and, and the invasion of Iraq and afterwards. And so if you were to write perhaps not a book length project, but if you were to go back and rework this narrative from the point of view of the President and the office of the President, what do you think you know and, and what do you think it's fair to infer? about how President Bush saw his own relationship with the Vice President and how and when that relationship changed. If at that moment that Comey threatens to resign, Bush genuinely doesn't understand what has been running under his feet, uh, what did he understand? And what did he endorse in his own mind as the delegated authority and role of the Vice President? And were there events like that that changed his thinking about how, as a CEO president, he was going to uh, connect or, or delegate to the OVP? Should I just stand yeah, standing? sure. I'll just sit down. That, that's a, a core question uh, of the book and of any account of the, of the Bush-Cheney uh, years, and it's a very hard one to be sure of. I thought for a while when I was, in fact, resisting this assignment at the Washington Post, and for more than a few weeks that was. Uh, my, if you want to know my method, it was to keep on saying, hey, look over here, I've got another project. <laughs> uh, my fear was that so much is done uh, with just Bush and Cheney in the room that how are you going to get at it? It turned out that Bush was not nearly as committed as Cheney was to secrecy. And he did talk to his closest advisors about uh, what he said, what Cheney said, and I was able to get some of them to talk to me about that, and, and many on the record. I mean, one of the things I worked hardest at, and, and that took up a huge amount of my reporting time, months of it, was getting not so much new information, but getting people who'd already given me information to agree to go on the record. And so I have on the record interviews with Condi Rice and Steve Hadley and Josh Bolton, Andy Card, and, you know, lots of others uh, in the book, uh, some were helpful than others, um, and some actually didn't know how helpful they were being. Because I mean, you know, when you're assembling, you know, as the CIA always says, when you're assembling the mosaic, uh, some little tile um, can be very significant, and even people who were uh, in or near the events don't know that. For example, Connie Rice told me on the record about her little conversation with Bush in which she said, something's up with uh, Comey, you ought to you ought to uh, ask him. She did not know how significant what that was. She did not know that she had just thrown him a rope for the first time in three months in which he could rescue himself uh, from, be, some, from driving right off a cliff. Just, just picture the situation. Um, Nixon uh, uh, fired a special prosecutor and two people resigned in protest and they called that a massacre. 
uh, you were about to have something like two dozen people, the whole top five layers of the Justice Department, all the assistant attorneys general. Too bad it didn't happen. Uh, this was March of 2004. Uh, Dan Bartlett told me you would have been a one-term president. Uh, so uh, th this is a very significant moment. Rice did not know what she did. Uh, uh, I don't think she did know until the book came out. Let me, let me uh, uh, before I open the floor, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, also make comment. One of, the, one of the things about the book which is so interesting, and, and, and Steve sort of referred to this, and, but I, I want to lay it out for folks who, who, who think about Cheney's way on the secrecy issue. One of the things I found fascinating is while Cheney was removing his name from certain kinds of executive orders, uh, he was adding the Office of Vice President to other executive orders. And I remember the debate about secrecy and who could classify or declassify secrets within the White House and did the Vice President's office actually have that ability as they, they applied it. When you went to the executive order and looked for how it had been amended, there had been one vague reference to the Office of Vice President in the underlying executive order. The amendment that brought it back had 11 references to the Office of Vice President with regards to secrecy, which was a fascinating expose. But a, f a friend of mine, Dave McCurdy, who actually has Andy Card's old job running the Automobile Manufacturers Association, former congressman from Oklahoma, used to travel a lot with uh, Vice President Cheney when he was a member of the House. And I asked him one time at a function, what was it like traveling with Cheney? What, would, what did you learn from him about being his travel buddy and when he would, you know, when you would ask questions? And he says, what's interesting about Cheney is that he would ask questions that implied uh, uh, of his view. I mean, in, in other words, he wasn't asking questions to ask questions. He was asking questions to convey a perspective and was only interested in things that essentially confirmed his worldview. When I read this, one of the really incredible things is the stories of Cheney calling a bureaucrat five levels down in the bureaucracy over endangered species or farming or salmon or whatever and, and asking a key question that fundamentally conveys you do this or else. And, and I, I like to, to, to ask you about, about that aspect of Cheney's character because you come away saying the war didn't matter, the energy, the secret energy meeting, that, that they use these as issues as ways to sort of sculpt what Cheney thought the executive branch should be in government. In other words, I was really struck by the fact that he didn't care so much about invading Iraq, didn't care so much about the energy meetings and keeping them secret, but nonetheless they became ways to deploy executive power and to, and, 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 and to uh, sculpt a presidency in a way that Bush himself never did. And I'm wondering if I'm reading that correctly. Uh, mostly, yes. I, uh, there, there are two kinds of uh, questions that Cheney asks. One of them is, as you describe it, in which you are, I mean, there's a you know, priceless moment in this, uh, in this uh, vice presidency in which uh, Cheney calls and leaves a voicemail for the 19th ranking official at the Interior Department. And she's, uh, it's so obvious that the vice president would never call that she deletes it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gets a call back some hours later, is there any special reason why you're not returning the vice president's call? Uh, and here he was indicating a direction, uh, which is um, it doesn't really matter what the Endangered Species Act says. Uh, there's a drought out in the Oregon, California border. Uh, there are farmers and ranchers who are going to lose their whole livelihood. There's got to be a way to get them the water. Uh, and that is what happened over a period of um, many months. Uh, he drove that process. And he never did it by issuing an order, never said thou shalt. He, uh, he simply asked leading questions. But he is not only interested, and this is another part of your premise, I think, in information that confirms his views. He is, he is truly uh, sort of omnivorous for information. He, he, is, he is very happy to talk to people who disagree with him, uh, very happy to talk to people who give him bad news, completely unlike Bush in that way. I tell the story of a, a defense intelligence agency named Derek Harvey who uh, comes in and tells Cheney that sort of essentially in reasonably diplomatic terms that everything that Cheney's saying in public about the war in Iraq is not correct. Uh, and, uh, and Cheney introduces him to Bush, brings him to the Oval Office. Now Bush, uh, let's say, it's safe to say, never wants to hear from this guy again. Uh, and Cheney invites him back over and over. And he wanted the more granular detail, the better. He, he had a finer understanding of events on the ground in Iraq than Rumsfeld did. And Rumsfeld went into it pretty deeply. Uh, so he does want to know. He uses that information for instrumental purposes. If the phone call or if the meeting is about making something happen, then he's leading you there. I mean, he always knows what he wants. He either knows what he wants or he knows he doesn't care. 
And there's, so there are whole areas of policy he checks out of. Let me open the floor. Uh, Helena Cobb. Hi, I love the book, Bart. Thanks for writing it. It's Thanks. just amazing. I mean, I think it also tells you something about the congressional leadership, not just the uh, executive branch. I'm fascinated by the role that he played on economics, because, I mean, I work on foreign policy all the time, but this came as a huge surprise. How much attention, what a big role he played. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. I mean, the way he played Greenspan and had Greenspan, you know, go to Congress and say essentially what he wanted him to go and say. I mean, think how different our economy might have been. Yeah, well, there are uh, several critical moments in which Cheney intervenes on economic policy, especially on taxes. And they also illustrate his methods pretty well. Uh, with Greenspan, as uh, just the, as with uh, the uh, environmental science of global warming or of uh, protected species, Cheney understood something critical that many people don't understand in government, which is that you don't have to win. Uh, uh, you have you have all you need is a tie. Uh, all you need to do is is defuse someone or something as an obstacle, uh, and then you could do what you want. So, for example. Um, Instead of, I mean, in the Environmental Species, the, the um, Endangered Species Act is categorical. There, there, you simply can't do anything that harms an endangered species. But what harms an endangered species? There's a scientific question there, and uh, and so uh, Cheney maneuvered so that the uh, the evidence became ambiguous. On on Greenspan, uh, he didn't have to get he didn't have to get the Fed chairman to endorse the uh, one point something trillion dollar tax cut in 2001, he had to get him not to oppose it. Uh, Greenspan had opposed a tax cut of maybe a, roughly one third as much in the late years of the Clinton administration, saying it was unwise. Uh, and all Cheney had to do was persuade him, uh, just be neutral. And he did, and it worked. Uh, when in the 2003 tax cut, Greenspan began to be very worried and thought that um, that uh, federal borrowing was driving out private borrowing uh, to the detriment of the economy. He passed along to Cheney as his conduit to Bush a paper which showed with evidence why that was true, why this was why the uh, short-term gain of the tax cut would be outweighed by medium-term losses uh, by you know the leading expert uh, uh, on the Federal Reserve um, economic team and. Cheney gave it to his one of his domestic policy advisors, a guy named Cesar Conda, and uh, Conda, who is, uh, you know, I mean, an, uh, he's an experienced sort of lobbyist and economic staffer, but not doesn't have a doctorate. Um, wrote a, a sort of a punchy cover memo on why the Federal Reserve had misunderstood its own data, uh, and circulated that in the White House. And so Greenspan, who thought that Cheney was his his uh, his honest broker, found that that he never actually did learn until again until the book that. Uh, that the memo never made it to the president. Gary, Metro. Mark, um, thanks. Um, I look forward to reading the book, and the, uh, that's important to say because the questions I'm going to ask will, re will re you gotta reveal be brief, that I have. Pardon? Brief. Uh, there are sort of two narratives floating around, one about the president, one about the vice president. And I'm curious to know whether your reporting corroborates or, or refutes. Uh, there is the, with respect to Cheney, that the number of close personal friends, longtime associates of Cheney's, who said, this isn't the guy I knew. And the, so that, that's about Cheney. And, and with respect to Bush, uh, it touches somewhat on Steve Cole's question, Cole, Cole's question. Uh, some time ago, Steve um, uh, Clemens did a session with Jane Mayer in which a lot of what you're talking about, Cheney and Addington, was really corroborates that. And a question was asked uh, of her about sort of where, where was Bush in all of this? And she had a wonderful phrase, which was, he keeps sliding out of the frame. And my question, therefore, on, on, on Bush is, did, did your reporting in all of this reveal that Bush is a president who keeps sliding out of the frame and was there any uh, sort of pattern to it? Does he come in early and then leave, or does he come in at the last minute? Great question. Uh, take Bush first. He uh, he slides out of the frame in terms of narrative sometimes because it's hard to it's hard to, to get what he's doing, and because there aren't as many people outside the Oval Office who are interacting with him as are interacting with Cheney and his people. 
Cheney operates on a much finer grain level. Uh, so part of the issue is that George Bush is not a detail man. There, there are certain details uh, that glaze his eyes. The federal budget, uh, when OMB gives uh, its number to each cabinet department, it is the federal government putting its money where its mouth is. And from time to time, a cabinet member will come in and say, hey, I can't accept that. This, I, I need more on this. This is, this is a matter of highest natural interest. Every other administration that comes to the president, uh, this administration created a budget review board chaired by Cheney because Bush didn't want it. Now, it's not that Cheney was doing something behind his back. He was taking delegated power that Bush didn't want. Uh, but Ch Bush said no to Cheney plenty. Uh, and you didn't know about that either because nobody advertised it. But for example, Cheney wanted universal inoculation against smallpox, which um, has been uh, extinct in, uh, in uh, human population for some years because he was afraid it would become a terrorist weapon. The president's advisors, the public health advisors, told him, you're going to kill two or 300 people if you do that with side effects. And Dan Bartlett's in the room, and he says he's just trying to picture the public relations campaign to, uh, <laughs> to explain that one. And Cheney said, well, that would be too bad. It would be a shame, and, and you know, I'm you know, sorry about that, but, but think how you'll feel if 10,000 people die later. And Bush said, look, I understand your logic, but I'm just getting off the bus. I'm not doing that. I'm just not doing that. Uh, and uh, there were plenty of those cases. So, and Bush reversed Cheney, just flat out about face reversed him on the warrantless surveillance program when he found out exactly what the stakes were. Uh, but he, he's a guy who sets broad visionary goals. And uh, unlike other presidents li who, who've done that, say Reagan, um, he had really only one very, very powerful um, implementer under him, at least for the first term. So you didn't have the Baker, Deaver, Meese, Troika, as you did back then. You had, you had no one who could challenge Cheney uh, in terms of influence. As for Cheney and whether he's changed, I spent a lot of time and effort trying to go into that in the book. Uh, I tend to believe that there's a lot more continuity than change, that people like Brent Scowcroft, who say they don't know him anymore, are... Um, remembering selectively, uh, partly because in previous administrations he was working for much more moderate presidents. And so he was the outlier. He was the guy who lost. Uh, when he wanted to sink Iraqi tankers after the invasion of Kuwait before the UN made a, uh, had a Security Council resolution, uh, Jim Baker and Scowcroft, and eventually uh, G, you know, George H.W. Bush thought that was crazy. Uh, and he lost. He wanted to recognize Lithuania. Um, right after the wall fell, as you know, independent of the Soviet orbit or the Russian orbit, he, there were a whole host of hardline positions he took on executive authority, and he he often got overruled. Uh, back then, he became the dominant player this time, and so people don't recognize him anymore. Now there are, I mean, there are health issues that can sometimes lead to personality change, but honestly, I haven't seen the evidence. That's interesting. Uh, in the very back, Patrick Malloy. Got to read um, the last chapter. You made a point about how starring the, Clements. Yeah. <laughs> you made a point about how the president was kind of ill-served with regard to that order on intelligence because he he hadn't been properly briefed that people had grave misgivings about it. I was always struck by the Iraq War that we suddenly had all these troops with all this uh, gear to ward off biological warfare stuck out in the desert and the pressure was we got to invade because summer's coming and we got to get it done before. Right. Was, was that deliberately done by Rumsfeld and Cheney as part of forcing Bush into this? I've always wondered about that, whether they got him into a situation where he really lost control of, of, his, of the decision on that. That's a great question. I think that Bush and Cheney came to this war decision uh, mutually for very different reasons. And this was often the case with Bush and Cheney, that they took very different paths to the same result. Uh, Bush really did believe in uh, transforming the uh, sort of regional game and global security environment by bringing democracy to, uh, to a tyrannical state. Uh, that was, I think, preeminent for him. Although he was worried, as everyone was, about WMD, because uh, although I think the nuclear case was basically nearly fabricated, the uh, the case for biological and chemical weapons was widely believed by intelligence agencies here and elsewhere. Uh, the this idea of people who who write about the military um, want to talk about operations and uh, and 
you know, and all the kind of the bang bang and and the cool gadgets. Uh, but people who really understand the subject want to talk about personnel and logistics. And you're absolutely right that by, by once you once you put a machine of you know over a hundred thousand troops and the logistics to support it. I mean, for example, just one tiny little fun fact. Uh, an armored division in combat burns a million gallons of fuel a day. Uh, you put that much stuff forward, uh, and you have to use it or bring it back because you you can't. Uh, and and bringing it back is a big retreat. So you know once you've done that, it, it, the argument can be you're going to look pretty bad if you um, if you withdraw. And it was true that the summer heat was considered uh, a huge disadvantage uh, to waiting. This this challenge. Uh, when President Bush found out that he had been out of the loop for three months, had given the implications for his presidency, which you have described, was and any time during your investigation or interviews, did you get any sense that Bush was outraged and wanted to call Cheney on the carpet? Uh, that would have taken place only one on one. I'm dying to know <laughs> <laughs> what conversation they had uh, after that. I don't understand to this day why Andy Card wasn't fired. Uh, or um, or Al Gonzalez. I mean, except that in Gonzalez's case, he was so close to the president. Uh, I think that the president was told a story before and afterward uh, that suggested that this was this was a last minute problem, and that there were there were ways in which you could maintain that storyline with selective use of evidence. And I don't know how much he ever understood fully. I mean, Jim Comey was not going to sit there and spell out for him step by step, you know, here's we did this, we did this, we did this, we did that. And nobody was going to say, here's why you, here's why your vice president screwed you. But he told, uh, he wrote a Blackberry message as soon as he left the Oval Office and he sent it to six people and I got a copy of the text. Uh, I mean, did, I try to be very transparent in the book and there's 70 pages of end notes and he said, he told the president that he was being misled. Uh, I think the president, there's good evidence that the president lost some confidence in the fullness of the advice he was getting from Cheney. Not so much the idea that he was being lied to or, or the information was being withheld, that Cheney as an anti-politician could afford to do things that a president couldn't, and that he had to subject Cheney's advice to additional filters. Well, can, can I just jump in before I go to Ed? Ed, did you have your hand up? Ed, Ed Levy here. Um, you know, not to joke about, about my mentioning in the last chapter, but the, but the serious issue and how you end is essentially this question of maybe Cheney had been out angled to some degree by other, and the way you tell that story is fascinating, that it looked as if the system had decided to try to contain him uh, and, and cut his wings, reduce the power and leverage and influence, and, and what's fascinating is you tell a story, I think, where, he, where his team wasn't read in. As, as his team was reading in others, his team was now being excluded. Was that in part related to this gentleman's question, George Bush allowing uh, competitive enterprises to, to, to box him in or not? There is a trajectory to the Cheney Vice President which his power peaks uh, in the first term and that's you could call his productive period where he can make big things happen, uh, big changes, term, you know, transformative changes on the economy, on, on regulation, obviously on interrogation, detention, surveillance and so on. Uh, the second term he's sort of less the driver and more the guy with his foot on the brakes to try to prevent the undoing of of, of what he's done. And part of it has to do with George Bush's increasing uh, self-confidence about uh, his, ex his knowledge and experience. Uh, for good reason, he's been president and making decisions, he's getting briefed and he knows a lot more than he knew at the beginning. Uh, he grows more doubtful of Cheney's judgment uh, when you consider the whole picture, which is, for example, that you know, political factors have to be taken into account. Uh, and there is, I'd say, a Newtonian reaction in the bureaucracy. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a natural, um, uh, or you could say it's antibodies. Uh, the, the people who Cheney was rolling or going around or causing to lose their jobs in the first term were replaced by cannier players. Uh, so the Assistant Secretary of State for um, East Asian Affairs, uh, you know, is changed on the second term, and he's a much more effective Chris bureaucratic. Chris, Chris Hill succeeds uh, Kelly, 
uh, is a much more effective bureaucratic player um, and knows how to use proxies and back channels and build coalitions uh, outside the official meetings. Uh, these are not uh, skills that Cheney invented from whole cloth. He just happens to be one of the great practitioners of them of all time, I'd have to say. Um, no one's sort of Baker and Kissinger um, uh, rivals him. And uh, so you have, you know, Josh Bolton comes in, succeeds a very weak chief of staff, and imposes much more structure on the White House and gives an on the record interview to me and, and to Joe Becker at the time in which he makes very plain that, um, that, that uh, Cheney is not a stand-in president, that either the president will make the decision, or if it's not a presidential decision, it'll be made in the cabinet or by me, he said. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Ed Levy. President Mike. Thanks. Uh, what would be your best guess of the role that's going to develop for Vice President-elect Biden? And is there any advice that you would uh, you give him? <laughs> the Republic should be very glad that I'm not giving Joe Biden advice uh, or anybody else. Uh, it's a fascinating question, and I think it's going to be a very complex and subtle thing to watch. Uh, even though, I mean, on, on the surface, Cheney was a uniter, uh, not a divider. Both parties uh, rejected his model of the vice presidency. McCain used him as a laugh line for the campaign uh, in, in Republican nominating debates. Uh, uh, Obama obviously has rejected that model. And yet, you can't help but think they're going to be a, um, that, that Cheney's influence is going to affect aspirations of his successors. Uh, Cheney was the first vice president to sit in on the National Economic Council meetings, the Domestic Policy Council meetings, the, the uh, National Security Principles Committee meetings, which is uh, when the president sits with them, it's called the National Security Council. And when he's not, it's called the Principles Committee of the, of the cabinet level advisors. If you're at that meeting, you're there when options are prepared for the president and when options are taken off the table. Uh, and that can be an enormous influence, especially if you're the only person in the room that everyone has to stand up for uh, when you walk in. Uh, and is Joe Biden not going to want to go to some of those meetings? I would think he would. Uh, is he going to have the dominant role uh, in shaping options? Gore did not attend for those meetings. It's fascinating. I mean, he, he, he sat with, but here's another thing. Gore sat with the president every day for his intelligence briefing, the, the daily, the presidential daily brief. Uh, Cheney did that too, but first he had the briefing at his house. Uh, uh, and in that briefing, he would ask questions and probe and take note of things that might want to be drawn to the attention of the president and he would task further analysis in certain areas to be brought to the president's attention in the future. It's an enormously powerful thing to hear the briefing first. And then to sit in, he doesn't say a thing when the president's there, I mean he defers, Bush is the one asking the questions, but he has shaped subtly what Bush is going to hear. Well the other thing is, I mean that you added was really in the book and shocking is that his staff were also had the titles of special assistant of the president and thus were copied on these key memos of, 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 of President Bush's while, while President Bush's team enjoyed no such privilege with sort of David Addington and Scooter Libby's memos. I mean, this is, this is an, another remarkable institutional uh, yeah, it, issue. Yeah. yeah. This, this gentleman here. I'm trying to work around this. Directly. Matt, did you have your hand up? Yes, right here. Um, You've got to use the mic. Yeah, I'm Ken Bernard. I was one of those um, people that was sidelined at times. And in fact, not read in? I'm not read in. Um, and I was the uh, special assistant to the president for bio defense, so um, it was, in, you know, I needed to know. Did a you lot. know that code? Did you know bananas? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> bananas were not. Um, I was not ready on bananas. Um, I will say this: this is perhaps the most brilliant, insightful book on this administration I've read, far none. Um, and I was there. I was also there in the Clinton administration, so I've seen the White House. I was in the NSC staff White House, in the Clinton administration as well. And the changes are remarkable. Um, I think that from what I can tell, if you read Bart's book, with very few exceptions, he's nailed it. I might also note, I don't know whether Steve Cole was um, his editor at the Post back in 99, he single-handedly declared AIDS a national security issue and um, dramatically changed the U.S. approach to the global, the global AIDS epidemic by merely stating something that everybody had kind of avoided because it was a difficult issue to merge an international, transnational health issue along with the um, 
the national security team, which had the tendency not to look at those issues um, in the same light as binational confrontational politics. But again, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated this. I also wanted to ask you about the heroes in this book. Um, you know, the John Bellingers and the Comeys, um, people I worked with that I think really stand out as uh, true patriots. Yeah, can you, can you respond quickly here? I want to get Jim Pinkerton. There are other questions, and I, I do want to leave time for people to um, buy books and get them signed. Uh, uh, I really want you to read this book as well. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real riveting uh, uh, but important book. So if you can respond quickly, we'll go to Pinkerton, see what we can handle, but then I want to break and have people an give people an opportunity to meet with you privately. Sure. Uh, uh, Ken, Ken, very interesting guy because he he was the first member of the NSC staff uh, ever to uh, be sort of the the um, health and sort of biosafety uh, component of the NSC that was never seen as a, a national security subject before Clinton, and that role was continued in some respect um, under Bush. And I've just forgotten what the uh, what the what the uh, the pinpoint question was at the end. Heroes. They're actually more hapless victims than heroes, actually, in this in this in this book. Um, and Bellinger's kind of on the on the uh, sort of uh, fence on that one. I mean, he gets outmaneuvered constantly, but he keeps on slugging. He's still there now, and he and he does fight back, and to some extent, he has an impact. But I mean, he's mostly the guy who keeps looking and going, "What was that?" You know, that just went just went by. I mean, and a lot of the people who protested lost their jobs. You know, Patrick Philbin was a major player in the Justice Department's rebellion on surveillance, and uh, the he was the choice of the uh, Solicitor General to be Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, which is an enormous job and a huge plum, and uh, Cheney's office sent word after the uh, earlier episode that he was not a suitable choice, and he's now in private practice. Mm -hmm. So mo most of the folks um, lost, and Comey and Goldsmith, I would say, is, is are, 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 are a singular example of uh, leading a rebellion that, that succeeded. For humor's sake, I would say that John Bellinger, who was a friend of mine, has spoken to New America about a dozen times. Uh, there was a point, low point, when he was thinking of leaving, and I said publicly, I said, do you really want to give David Addington one nanosecond longer than you uh, in, in government? So I think uh, uh, he's going to stick it through to the very end. Uh, Jim Pinkerton. Uh, Steve, you mentioned uh, Scooter Libby uh, yes. a moment ago, and that leads me to ask Mr. Gelman, do you foresee the Vice President's participation, or for that matter, the Bush administration, taking action on a pardon for Libby or possibly others in the remaining weeks of, of this presidency? Well, for sure there'll be some pardons. Uh, the the, 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 the vice president, they, they have all, here's the thing, there's been talk about whether you can do categorical class or preemptive pardons, uh, what, of course you can uh, if you're president. David uh, Addington pardoned for all uh, I, possible future I, you, you have to accept a pardon under law to, uh, to, uh, for it to have any effect, and I'm quite confident uh, that Addington would not accept a pardon because uh, he believes everything he did was right and uh, he would much rather he would much rather fight that out. I mean, he's he is a zealot. Uh, at, you know, by his own terms, he's a very principled man, uh, and and he sticks to those principles even when it's not convenient or even very costly. Uh, and that's that's the same with Cheney. They start with fairly uh, uncontroversial propositions. You know, the president, uh, the, the deliberative process in the White House is improved if people have some privacy and don't have to worry that every single thing they say will be on the front page of the Post tomorrow. Uh, and he takes that proposition to the point that there's essentially no other value. There's no issues of accountability or of improving advice or information. It, the secrecy is is uh, taken to the ultimate. Uh, will Libby be, get a full pardon? I used to think that was a done deal and a, and, a, and a slam dunk. And I'm not sure I do anymore. I think that Bush may decide that the uh, sort of splitting the baby the way he did which with uh, with uh, clemency on the penalty phase without erasing the conviction might have been the right call. And I think because he did lose confidence uh, and, and, and did have some unhappiness at some of what happened uh, from Cheney and the, the Libby thing was also very costly to him. He, he may not be in a mood to do it. Um, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to let people buy their books and talk with, uh, uh, pose their questions to, uh, uh, to, to, to Bart uh, individually. But Steve, would you like to offer any closing uh, comments or thoughts? 
Well, I want to I want to uh, uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. Of course, we have Glenn Cooper joining us, but please join me in giving uh, Bart Gelman a real round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to grab him and take him out front so that people can get in line for the book and meet him individually. Don't rush the front.